Welcome to episode 100 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with strength and conditioning coach, speaker and lecturer, Dan Baker. Thanks for tuning in to episode 100 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. So after a tiny bit of deliberation, uh, there was only one guy that I wanted to get on and, and stalk and pester to, to come on and be, uh, be guest 100, and that was that was Dan Baker. So already a legend in my mind for living in Bali for six months of the year. Um, so I just want to welcome Dan to the podcast uh, and thank him for his time. So welcome to the podcast, Dan. Thanks, Robert. No worries, mate. So just want to, anyone that doesn't know who you are, just want to give us a little bit of an intro on, on you and a little bit about your background and, and what you're currently doing. Uh, yep, yeah, I'm probably most famous or renowned, I should say, for uh, being strength coach of the Brisbane Broncos for 19 years. Um, and, you know, probably the impact I had of, of uh, was, you know, making it normal to lift heavy weights in preparation for both, you know, rugby league and rugby union um, and lifting them all year round. Um, and the first five years of the Broncos, uh, I was there and we won the title three times. Um, and then, you know, everyone started to cotton on that, you know, doing heavy full squats doesn't give you knee injuries or give you cancer or make you a worse athlete or stuff like that. And, uh, you know, people started to copy what we do, or, or, you know, I shouldn't say copy, they started to actually train properly and, and hire other good strength conditioning coaches. So I've had an influence that way as in um, it opened up for a lot of really good strength coaches to be working at other clubs and also to be, you know, pretty, pretty successful. And uh, I have a PhD, so I'm one of those people in Australia who uh, have a PhD but don't lecture at the university. We work in the in the field, so we speak, and I'm... Um, I might have been the first one or one of the first ones, um, but there's lots now. Like you can go to Port Adelaide and they've got two PhDs on their strength conditioning staff, <laughs> Darren Burgess and Ian McKean. So it, it, it's norm, a bit more normal in Australia. So I, 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 a little bit of a pioneer in a way, but also not a pioneer, just following on upon others in a way as well. Mm -hmm. so. so what are you currently doing at the minute? Well, I no longer work uh, with any full-time, many teams. I work more as an educator of strength conditioning coaches now, uh, or sports science. So um, I have two university lecturing roles uh, 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 as a guest lecturer or adjunct lecturer, I should say, at um, Edith Cowan University in Perth in their master's program of strength conditioning, and also uh, a similar role in the master's program of St. Mary's in London, which I started there this year. So. They're two really good uh, master's programs that I'm involved with. Um, I really enjoy both of them. And I lecture, you know, in Australian Strength Conditioning Association courses. I'm still president, so we have levels, you know, uh, zero, one, two, and three. Uh, I lecture in those courses and uh, also have my own workshops, which uh, I do all around the world, um, uh, US, Brazil, China, uh, UK, Island, where, where, where they need to be done or wherever people want me to do a workshop, I'll, I'll do them. So, uh, more, more, more of an educator now. But I, even last year, I still did some strength conditioning. I worked the Wallabies for a few weeks. Uh, they had a pre-season camp before they went away to the World Cup. Um, so, we made sure they were in pretty good shape. So, you worked with Kelvin Giles at the Broncos? Uh, K Kelvin got me in initially. Uh, and what happened was... Uh, the company that owned the Broncos then, they also owned a uh, baseball team and a basketball team. And Kelvin had a, was sort of the overseer of all three sport franchises in a way. So he wasn't working hands-on at the Broncos then. Um, so he was more of an overseer role. But, yeah, but he, he's the one who uh, employed me or, or brought me into the Broncos, yeah. I did a podcast with him um 
probably two months ago now. And uh, your name came up as the only PhD that is uh, ever employed, which was, uh, <laughs> which was nice. Um, well, I didn't have a PhD then, so... Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, okay. Interesting, right. Because a few... Well, actually, I was only a master's then. Right, okay. Because a, uh, a few PhD students got in touch with me after that and said, uh, oh, I've just started a PhD, maybe I should, maybe I should stop. After uh, a couple of Kelvin's <laughs> comments. <laughs> that's not your PhD study. Just make sure you can work in the real world. Like I said, there's, there's two of them at Port Adelaide working there. So, you know, it's, yeah. it, it just, you, you can be scientific, and, but you're still going to train athletes. And uh, <laughs> what you get sometimes is not Will's best practice coming from yeah. all around you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's one thing I'd like to touch on, actually. And, and it's, it's difficult when you obviously, when, when you're in a club to, like, like you were in the Broncos for so long, to uh, kind of get out there and see what other practitioners are doing. So when now you've left kind of full-time full -time coaching position, how do you see the, the state of strength and conditioning going around the world? And is it is it better than what you, is the state of the industry, what you thought been oh. while you were in, in Yeah, yeah, it's very good. Yeah, it's very good. Um, you know, people, I, I see a lot of stuff on social media lamenting. They're talking about personal trainers. You know, strength conditioning with elite athletes and, and uh, professional athletes and uh, semi-professional. I see it as everywhere I go, I, see, I meet really smart people, really good people. The, you know, the, the, the challenge is not how much we know, it's what we can implement with our athletes. You, you go to American professional football teams, Texans, or anyone, you know, talking to Joe Ken, they're only really allowed to see the athletes certain times a day and for certain uh, so many hours. So it's not what you can know, it's what you can actually do, given in that situation the collective bargaining agreement of the professional players um, and how often you're allowed to see a player. Same in American college football. So if people look at programs from outside, they don't realize the constraints or restraints you're under as a strength and conditioning coach. You know, they're not in the real world. You, you can't often do what you want to do or can do or should do because of other constraints upon you that have nothing to do with physiology or, or training science. Yeah, there are other constraints and restraints on us. Which is it, which is it, obviously social media is such a, uh, a great tool for, for, especially for this type of thing, for sharing information. But like you say, it can be an absolute killer when somebody puts just innocently a video or something and everyone jumps on the bandwagon of bashing this guy or you know yeah, what they're yeah. doing and it can be yeah yeah, yeah. Well, I, know. I know and then just i've seen it before and uh just you wankers get in the real world you know you're with athletes for a couple of hours you know just there's so many constraints and restraints you're under and you know you might be given an athlete who's trained with someone for eight years who's let a development occur in technique that's really poor but you can change that in implementing two episodes of the ability ward yeah. you know Please. <laughs> yeah I'm not knocking mobility water or anything there, but, you know, I see people saying, you know, I would do this from an episode of blah, blah, blah. And the, you, you have to change your motor pattern that's really dominant for, you know, in athletes sometimes it's very hard when you've got certain constraints there, time-wise and energy-wise. And, you know, the strength conditioning is a side product of what, if you take a rugby athlete, league or union or soccer or anything, the strength conditioning is just a little byproduct of their total global training regimen. No. So, so what, just to, just touching on that kind of constraints um, situation that you mentioned, and that's that kind of brings me nicely to uh, a topic that you discussed on the, the webinar we did, probably uh, seven eight months ago now, and that was working with young players and the the problem with fast tracking, which you went yeah. into detail with with the situation at, at the Broncos. Do you just want to talk to us a little bit about maybe your the system that you implemented there with with fa well going against the fast tracking model of, of the getting the NRL player to be in the first team at, as young as possible. Um, and maybe some examples, well, some, maybe some examples. Well, I should say it's not the system I implemented, it was the system that was implemented. Like Kelvin was influential okay. in it. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. A lot of people was coming together and saying, this is not right. Uh, we we're getting 17 year olds finishing high school to play 50 games, but you know, hadn't lifted weights or uh, had a lot of injuries because of just playing all the time. So the system was, you know, the kid is ready when the kid is ready. No one's going to be a, an NRL star before he's probably 21 or 22. 
um, they get a little bit of exposure, maybe 19 or 20 couple of games here and there or off the bench. But, you know, we're going to make train these kids up because once they get to 22, we're not going to make much change in them uh, because of then playing will be the main focus, you know, and, uh, and other training. So you've got maybe 14 or 15 years of age to 21, 22 to get this thing right whilst this kid goes through growth spurts and all that. So there's a process there. Um, you know, I, I have my long-term athlete development model for resistance training and, and, you know, we want to move kids from, you know, stage one and two, um, you know, which is body weight and movement orientated, uh, you know, through to, you know, probably stage five um, by, by 21 or 22, which is like, you know, professional or, you know, being able to train at NRL level without any uh, restraints, you know, without physio saying, oh, he can't full squat or he can't bench press or he can't do a chin up because he's got this wrong or that wrong. <laughs> yeah. How's he going to handle 210 kilogram men running at him at eight minutes per second if he can't do a controlled squat? But yeah, you know my point. Uh, so yeah, we have a program or have had a program in place to, you know, a slow burn on these kids um, uh, to, you know, have good movement, um, and good patterning in the movements, you know, from say 14 through to 17 or 18, then we'll start adding the power then. There's no use having the strongest 14 year old in the world. You're not gonna make, play professional football, rugby union, or rugby league until he's 20 or 21. So what did- You know, won't, won't earn big money all that. So you just wanna take, I mean, obviously you've mentioned uh, a little bit about the levels there. And, and, and in the webinar, you mm -hmm. kind of touched on where do we actually need to get these guys? And you, you presented some data of, of the kind of the, the gap between the two and how you uh, how you're going to go about making that jump. But for for someone who maybe doesn't have that kind of long term data, looking back, how we how are you how would you now look forward to say this is where this kid needs to be? Uh, well, first thing is, and the fundamental thing is, they must have good uh, movement through full range. That's the paramount thing. So you know, you can't go to the next level. If you can't do an overhead press or full squat, we can't load you in those movements. I mean, if you can't get range there, how, how do we load you in those movements? So, you know, I, I find it problematic when people say, oh, but, uh, we can't do full squats with him with a barbell. Well, no, you can do full squats without a barbell first, and then medicine balls or, you know, goblets or something like that, bands and sandbags before you put a barbell on. So, you know, movement is paramount. They've got to move first, and then they'll be able to replicate that, you know. Have, so, you know, it's a good way to remember is like, I like the thing that Nick Winkleman uses, like, uh, uh, you know, ha position, pattern, power. Get the range, move fluidly, then when you can load you up, whether it's with weight, whether it's speed, whether it's the intensity of our MAS running. If you can't run properly, I can't even MAS run you pr to a high level, you know. You're going to be on a bike doing non-specific stuff. So we need good movement first. And then, you know, it's a little bit organic. Kids will move along. Uh, you know, we have our certain strength scores. I know where they need to be um, at the end of the NRL career. And we'll just sort of go back and sort of split the difference between stages. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to... Basically, I don't want to give out numbers again, Robert, because... No, 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 absolutely like, not. No, 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 so, so they, not. They, they want to stip... They say, oh, well, my kid's ahead of what Dan Baker's thing, and, you know, he said they squat X, and my kid's doing X plus 10 kilos, so he's ahead of it. And then all of a sudden, they're neglecting looking at movement and all that sort of stuff. Uh, for, for me, it, 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 it's about quality of technique and quality of movement as they move through to stages, you know, one, two, three, and four. It's really only stage, uh, later stage four as they transition into stage five. So stage four would be, you know, when they're f finishing high school and in a, an academy squad and, uh, and they look to get to stage five, which is uh, like a full-time professional. You know, that's when the numbers start becoming more important um, because for stage four, you, you just really want that good movement and that good technique and to be training and, and patterning exercises, yeah, we're gonna get a little bit stronger, but you know, the numbers is less important. Getting into stage four, the numbers are less important. It's once we're in stage four, you know, you've been training for a few years, you've got good technique, 
now we really start need to put power on, into the system and uh, we have certain scores you need to be able to compete with the big boys so to make that professional contract has become more important but unless we get those based on you know, based on period there it's not going to happen anyhow so numbers are more important in stage four before that they're probably a little bit less important technique and, and coach's eye and, and uh, efficiency and all that sort of stuff and, and t attending training and they're more important. So is that exactly the same with the, the kind of power end of the spectrum? Yeah, because parents reflect their strength. Well, without any injuries, we'll move fast then, um, you know, if we have the strength or, or try to build it speaking on. So yeah, so power and strength, I'll go together um, with our training and, and development. But, you know, our st stage four is when they're not important. Before that, let's just have good technique and train. We will have numbers still, but they're not the focus, entire focus of our training. You know, it's, it's gaining that weight, having good technique, um, whilst we gain this actual body weight, they get aerobically fitter, uh, still have to get faster. Um, so there's, you know, th th these are problems we have to solve. Uh, we, you know, we know in, for example, on a 20, we believe that the players in games move at 93 meters per second in the forwards. Uh, sorry, 93 meters per minute of game time, but at NRL they move 111 meters. They also are about 15 to 20 percent stronger in NRL, and about five kilograms heavier. So across the two or three years of stage four, you have to improve your aerobic capacity 20 percent, your upper body and lower body strength about 20 percent, and gain five kilos. So that's the problem. That's the difficulty. So uh, you know you can make people 20 percent stronger. That's easy. You can make people 20% aerobically fitter, not so easy, but it can be done. Doing both together at the same time whilst improving your ability to play a sport, that's the hard job. So when it comes to the aerobic side of things, um, there's obviously been plenty of work from your side of things with, with MAS running, and there's obviously um, people out there that are going to um, kind of dispute that, but w what was your – what's uh, your yeah. – come well, my thing is, MAS is a measure. I, I probably should say, MAS is just a measure. It's like saying 100% 1 RM. It's 100% it's MAS is your measure of your aerobic speed. Now, whether you train and do 15 on, 15 off at one percentage of this, or you say, I don't believe it, it doesn't really matter. It's a measure. It's not a, it's not a type of training. It's a measure of, of a system. It's a measure of speed. So it's saying max speed training. You know, you measure someone's max speed, then you're training. You measure someone's max aerobic uh, speed. It's just a measure. Now, do you believe that's important or not important? You know, does, does it correlate or differentiate between athletes of different sports? Now, I've got a paper we just published with Nathan Heenley where we put out the max aerobic speed of athletes of different levels in rugby league, union, soccer, netball, field hockey, both male and female, from you know different ages through to professionals to gold medalists, and MAS scores do tend to be higher in athletes at higher levels and at higher age groups from first division, second division, third division. Now, if the data says that, you would think that a measure of MAS and improving that would suggest it's correlated with improvement in performance. And research shows as you improve people's MAS, their game involvements do improve. Now, if the data says that, why not train? People argue, I don't like MAS training. I don't give a flying fuck. <laughs> don't do it then. Do what you think is important, mate. I do what the evidence suggests. So I know people say, oh, I don't measure it. I don't measure stuff. Fucking fine. Keep your job some other way then. I, I, I'd like to see, I don't know how people keep a job but they have no measures of strength or conditioning and uh, how do they convince the coach that the players are improving? If the players are winning, yeah. As the players start losing, coaches look for excuses. Are these players fit enough, strong enough, fast enough? You have to have your evidence say, yes, they are. So, you know, if people want to do MAS, what I call MAS type training, what I just call training, using MAS as a measure to base training upon for open conditioning, that's what it is. It's a measure to prescribe intensities from, whether it's lower than the MAS or higher than the MAS, which means it also includes anaerobic. So once you go over 100% MAS, you're including anaerobic training in the drill. If you want to do 70% and go for a three hour run, good. I've got a mate who just won the world championships in um, stand up paddle boarding in, a, in a Hawaii over 50 years. That's an aerobic event, it took him five and a half hours, almost six hours. 
can do an MAS type training, what people call MAS training, because it's a six hour event. He's training, most of his work is done at 60 or 70% of his MAS speed. So he's not doing 100%, you know, 20 seconds on, 20 seconds off. It's not the nature of his event. So, you know, if you're in a field sport, it is in the nature of your event. If you're doing something for two or three hours, it's not in the nature of your event to be using high intensity intervals at 100% MAS or 110% or 120 or 95 or whatever. So how were you using the, the MAS testing uh, results to, to gauge your kind of pre-season, in-season, off-season training? Well, it's just, it's just a fitness measure. It's like saying, we had to use 1RM, you just use the prescribed intensity then. So, you know, we can say we're going to do 20 seconds on, 20 seconds off on a Concept 2 rower, or we're all going to row 100 metres. The guy beside me is 110k, then he's got a halfback beside him who's 80k. They're, they all row the same distance. No, we've got to prescribe it individually, same as we were on bench press or squat. So we use that as a measure. And we're saying, okay, we're doing a certain percentage of our, each individual's measure of fitness on this device or in this mode of training, and then we'll prescribe from there. So if we're going to do, say, on the rowers, 20 seconds on, 100% MAS, 20 seconds off, each guy will have his own uh, prescription of how far that is. For some guys, it might be 108 metres, some might be 92, but it's their prescription. Same as if we're doing squatting and saying, doing 10 or 70%, some guys might have 140K on, some guys might have 92 kilos on. It is what is the individual's prescription. That is what MAS is. It allows us an individual prescription rather than the old method, you know, and I'm still around for this where, you know, we'll all run 100 metres in 20 seconds, all of us, the football team. Halfbacks are running backwards the last 10 metres, telling jokes to each other. The front rowers are struggling to get there, you know. Some guys are overloaded, some are underloaded, some are, you know, it's goalie locks, some are just right. So MAS lets us to individually prescribe as we should, as we do when we're doing strength work. So is there certain times of the year that you would emphasize certain percentages of MAS? Ah, oh, yeah, we, you know, you want to start, you don't want to start the pre-season over 100% because that means you're using anaerobic, you're hitting anaerobic too early. It's, you should be using, you know, 100% less in the first few weeks and then build up. Oh, you know, you, you have to have some aerobic base. You can't have an athlete welcome back to training, hit them anaerobically hard the first day. Now they'll break down. You, you need to build up some anaerobic, some aerobic condition. So, you know, longer intervals at, you know, 90%, you know, three minute intervals at 90% or, um, you know, doing the 100%, 70% grids. So it averages out at 85, um, you know, the, the, the rectangles like that. You know, that's what should start your training. Don't go straight into, oh, let's go to Dubai, 120% MIS, you know, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off, five minutes of that. Welcome to day one and kill guys. <laughs> you know, the, the, the people say, oh, I, I saw Dan Baker's thing and I did it first day and everyone dropped over and I couldn't handle it. Yeah, it's too anaerobic to handle first up. You've got to progress. It's like saying, you know, let's hit three RMs first day of training. You've got to progress. Start with lower intensity, higher volume, and progress the intensity upwards as you reduce the volume. And so the first few weeks we increase volume as well, but you get to a certain point where we flip the coin and we say now we're bringing volume down. And uh, as you bring volume down, you can start combining, uh, you know, your conditioning drills with more skill drills and, and small-sided games and putting fatigue into athletes and trying to see you know, where the MA, where the conditioning-induced fatigue causes a decrease in their skill or tactical awareness. And that's what we really want to do. So why does, why does build, the, the, the kind of term building the aerobic base, why does that get such a, a bad rap if that's, if that's the case? Because oh, people, can, people uh, see that as going like 30-minute road runs or like two-hour road runs. Yes. And that's, and that's old school stuff, you know. If you want to do 30 minutes, get on a bike or something, do it low impact is pretty bad for. You know, you can do occasional, especially the first week or two with, you know, league guys and union guys, you can do, you know, one longer run per week, just, uh, you know, a bit of basic conditioning for them. So they do, I mean, they do have to play 40 minutes and a half, but, uh, 
the intensity of that stuff is too low to um, mimic what they're going to be at. But most of the work should be, you know, shorter duration and not not road running for you know thirty minutes or six kilometres or eight kilometres or something like that. Yeah. But I'm saying you can do one good run per week the first two or three weeks like that. I'm not saying don't do it. It's not you know if you're training four days a week or three days a week aerobic conditioning, you don't do it three days a week for three weeks. Then all of a sudden hit intervals and expect everything's peachy dory. <laughs> you know, like oh, that's cool. So I just want to um, just want to move on a little bit to something that's obviously fresh on your mind after the uh, the push workshops in America, and that was velocity based training. And the the little note that I'd sent over to you was a bit of a uh, put a note on there, a bit of a history lesson. So it was just interesting to see because it is it does seem relatively new, but obviously you've been doing it for for quite a while now. Do you just want to give us a little bit of a history lesson on the velocity based training at the Broncos? Um, yeah, well, what I want to say is again, and people get this confused. I don't believe in totally velocity based training. Velocity is a measure that I use. Same as MAS is a measure I use. So it how I use sets and reps and percentage one RM. Velocity is coincides with those factors. So it allows me to see when I don't know someone's percent one RM or where it could be different one day. Velocity allows me to see what it is. So you know you, we do do velocity based training, especially for power exercise, we, we want to get a certain velocity, but you know, on strength stuff, we, you know, we want to lift a certain weight, <laughs> you, you know, no one's going to win a gold medal Rio for the fastest power clean. <laughs> it's going to be who lifts the most weight, um, exerts the most force, so, yeah. So basically, I've been using velocity measures uh, in training since 1993, um, in the early days, the velocity measuring device was built into a Smith machine. It was a, the plyometric power system um, that was developed in Australia by uh, Professor Rob Newton and Dr. Greg Wilson and Mark Fisher as well um, from Swift. Um, and, uh, you know, they had four in Australia at the time. We, we bought one of the Broncos, uh, they had one at the university where they were, uh, one of the Queensland Academy of Sport, one of the Australian Institute of Sport, and also the Chicago Bulls bought one. and. Um, Boyd Epley's uh, University of Nebraska had a couple as well, you know, and we were really into that stuff at the time, measuring the velocity of the power during, you know, jump squats, bench throws and all that sort of stuff, uh, dynamic push presses, anything we could do on, on the Smith machine. So a lot of our stuff in the early days was, was always on that and it was built in the Smith machine so we never really looked at the velocity of our heavy strength exercise, our heavy squats, our heavy bench presses so much. Um, and then over the last few years, the Spanish, they've been working to measure velocity during heavy squats and bench presses and now shoulder presses and a few other exercises as well and start to see this really strong relationship between percentage 1RM and strength uh, in an individual. So when you combine uh, their recent research and my older research, you start to see uh, a lot about the athlete's state or the shape they're in um, from the velocity data and, and the marrying of this velocity across a, a spectrum. Um, yeah, you know, from 100% down to lower percentages, there's uh, uh, athletes have a sort of a profile or a bit of a signature, um, if you could describe it as that. And what, what we'll see is, you know, for certain athletes, for example, one of the main things to know is when we're talking heavy strength exercises is an athlete's 1RM speed on any given exercise, any given strength exercise, squat, bench press, deadlift, something like that, shoulder press, the speed of their 1RM rep is the same speed as the fifth rep of a 5RM or the third rep of a 3RM, or the eighth rep of an 8RM. And that's their max effort speed then. So if they go below that speed, they will fail the rep, they fail. So knowing that speed and how far away from it we are gives us an indication to the fatigue level of that set. So if I don't want my athlete to get too fatigued, 
I stay a certain amount of velocity away, or a certain percentage or a certain speed away from my fatigue speed. So if I did not want my athlete to train to failure on squats and I knew that their one RM or fatigue speed was say 0.35, if I keep them, if the first rep of the set was say uh, 0.6, if I stop their set at when the reps get to 0.45, I know they're not overly fatigued from that set. They're sort of half a minute. If I want them to be not fatigued at all, I would stop them at 0.5. Obviously, if I want them to train to failure, they'll go to 0.35 on that last rep. So not knowledge of that fatigue speed uh, or, or max effort speed, whatever you want to call it, and uh, what they should get on their first rep or second rep, whatever is the best, um, allows us to control training uh, fatigue within a set across time. I'm just going to take a very short break uh, in between uh, Dan speaking about velocity-based training. So in the second half of this episode, you can look forward to Dan talking about using, uh, using the push band to gauge readiness. There's a little bit of uh, poor sound quality that's just to start the second half of this, uh, of this episode, but stick with it, it'll last about 30 seconds. I've tried to make the best of it I can, um, but stick with it. Uh, I'm sure you'll get tons out of it as I'm sure you have in part one. So I know this is episode 100 and I just wanted to take the opportunity to say a massive thanks to everyone for the continued support uh, and the kind words that have been uh, been sent to me and, uh, and just thanks a lot for tuning in uh, every week uh, and hope you've got so much out of it, uh, which I know I, I have. So massive thanks to Train With Push and Valve Performance makes the Nord Board for sponsoring this episode today. So if you do want to get a push band and you are based in the UK, you can go to proformance.pro and if you put Pacey Perform in the checkout box, uh, the voucher code box when you hit checkout, you can get free delivery to anywhere in the UK. So if you're inspired by Dan's chat uh, and all his, his talk about push, um, you can get free delivery, uh, which I've sorted out for just the podcast listeners. So I hope you enjoyed part one and I'm sure you'll enjoy part two. Uh, I'll speak to you soon. Enjoy. So are you using um, the velocity of a lift to gauge readiness for that person in their kind of warm set to then Yes, the rest. Yeah, you can okay. do that. Yeah, I'll give you a classic example, Robert. So I lectured at uh, St. Mary's. I had to fly uh, to London. It's a long flight. I had to get a bus to the airport in Australia, then, you know, various other flights. And uh, before I went, I, I squatted five on 185. I'm in good shape. And uh, no, I got my velocity of my last warm up set and then, you know, all my other sets. So I get to. St. Mary's, uh, uh, my velocity is down about 8 or so percent on the last one. I did this workout five days after I got there because I knew the first day after I get there, I'm not going to lift good. And I could only get to five reps at 175. But my velocity even told me I'm not going to get to the, my top weight that day. I already knew. I still try to get there because um, <laughs> I'm pig headed. <laughs> then when I flew back to Australia, I I had 37 hours transit uh, from when Rob Anderson dropped me at the airport till I walk in the door. I squatted 40 hours, 40 hours later. My last warm-up set was down 21%, even what it was on the week before St. Mary's, and about 30% of what it was the week before I went to St. Mary's when I squatted 5 and 185. So my velocity of my last warm-up set is down all the way. The one I did last week was that in London, on 170, you know, like, it was telling me, you're not covered. So the velocity of the last one up second indicate how you are today. Now, you can probably try and ignore it a little bit and, and do something better. You might, might fire you up and say, oh, I think I'll, I'll still try. But you want to get a PB, you know. You, you can try, but unless you really were late in your last one up second, your first ramp up set, you're not going to get PBs that day. Conversely, when an athlete's coming in and they're smashing their warm-up sets, and you're looking at them going, hey, let's kick down the door today, baby. Let's go. And you know, every time we do uh, one of my workshops, 
that happens, I say to athletes, that's a pretty good velocity, what's your PB? So every workshop we've done with athletes doing uh, power cleans or hand cleans, we've got guys getting PBs because they say, you're not at one RM, mate. They hit what they think is one RM. I say that velocity is telling me you are not at one RM. So we've had guys go for 125 hand clean to 150, 120 to 140. Um, the smallest improvement we got was 120 to 123. So that's the dumb thing. Not me, <laughs> he's telling us, and then there's a lot of coaches there as well. There is a f facilitation effect of having good coaches. There's you know, 20 coaches in the room or 30 coaches for sure. But, you know, when, when someone says, oh, I think I'm at one RM, you say, mate, you're not. Here's the data. You're not there. You can got more in you. And there's objective data to support that. They find a gear then. So, you know, the flip side of velocity is it can say, when you're ready to go for good lifts and when you should hold back. But, you, you know, normally your velocity should therefore reflect your training plan. So you should take that into account your training plan. So normally my training plan, if I'm not training uh, and having all this jet lag type stuff, I just follow my training plan because of my velocity score of my last warm-up set will reflect exactly what I've got planned. But when you're traveling or other stresses there, lack of sleep, uh, other sports training, you can have a plan, but you have to have a, um, a, be ready to adjust the plan. And velocity can give you a sort of objective, concrete data about how you might adjust it, you know, upwards, downwards, 2%, 5%. So, for example, uh, a change of your last warm up set in the squat of, say, 0.05 or so meters per second might mean you adjust the weights two and a half percent. Um, 0.04, 0.05 meters per second change is about two and a half percent one RM in the squat. So when, when I said my velocity was down 20%, that doesn't mean my strength is down 20%. It means my strength was down, uh, the velocity decrease suggested my strength was down about 8%. So it's it's, not 20% velocity change doesn't mean 20% velocity uh, strength decrease. So it's how much velocity change in 0 0.0 something meters per second. So if you can, a basic way to remember is, you know, 0 0.04, 0 0.05 is about 2.5% for a squat. It, it varies depending on if you're strong or weak, actually. So you have to come to my workshop to hear all the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just, for, just for interest, how long did it take you to get back to... Um what you were pre-travel? I oh, still haven't got there because then, yeah, next week I went to the US. And... All oh, right, okay, so we don't know yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, I, I got, by the end of that week, um, I was close. So I, I arrived home on Saturday afternoon. I squatted Monday, Wednesday, and then by Friday I squatted 6 and 175, which is not 5 and 185, but it's, it's getting close. Um, so five days, I was pretty close. Um, and the, the velocity of the last warm-up set was not 100% of what it used to, normally was, but it was getting close. It was, you know, it was suggested it was 2.5% down still. So, you know, I think 5 and 185 converses, versus 6 and 175, yeah, that's probably about a 2.5% difference in 1RM. I think we might say that. Um, and that's what the velocity suggested. I was 2.5% out rather than 8% like it was earlier in the week. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so something you mentioned a little bit ago um, was the uh, creating a, a low velocity profile. So I know that's that's something that you can do in within push. But why why would people take the time to do that, and why would uh, working off the back of that be beneficial? Oh man, my big thing on velocity profiling now is I would say to people just do three tests: do a uh, do a, a jump squat, measure peak velocity with a down rod on your shoulders. And get you know it'll be 3.5 minutes per second or 3.3 something like that. Get peak velocity. Have your one RM max effort speed. Whether you test one RM or you do a five RM, get that speed. You know that. And then just test 50% of your one RM squat and look at the average power there, average velocity, I should say. There's three tests because what they are, are are the two ends of the spectrum: zero weight, you know, the dowel rod, just body weight jumping, one RM strength. So the exact opposite on the spectrum, 50% one RM right in the middle. That's the easiest profile to do, I think. And then, you know, 
then you can compare between athletes and say, ah, oh, mm, this athlete had very good velocity with you know the Dow rod, but the strength level's low, and uh, they don't use their strength even at fifty percent. They don't have good velocity uh, or good power, and so forth. Um, so that's a simple test. So I, I, I used to do far more complex tests, and over time, you know, I used to do. Uh, 20K, 40K, 60K, 80K, 100K, 120K, you know, one RM, hang clean in there as well yeah, to split the difference. Um, and all it says is, you know, I needed to do just, you know, one RM, <laughs> a light weight and something in the middle because mm -hmm. all the others just reflected that. Okay. So, uh, what was I going to say then? Oh, yeah. Just to, um, while you do mention, I know you quickly mentioned the UK workshops, just before I forget, when are the UK workshops, forgive me if I'm wrong, uh, 15th of September? Yes, yep. at Sheffield, Sheffield Hallam University. Um, yeah, it's, you can look at the details on uh, eventbrite.co.uk. There's uh, a link you can purchase your uh, ticket to attend that. Um, so there's two workshops down or just one? Just the one, mate, just okay. the one. Uh, that's it. My, I, I'm attending the UK SCA conference, and uh, I just people want me to do an extra. I did one workshop in London this year, and a lot of people from the north said, "Yeah," or from Ireland said, "We can't get to that." So that okay, well, I'll do one in the north. Um, we'll also we're we'll looking at velocity, but also we're doing the long-term athlete planning in it as well, Robert. You know, I'm going to show the stages, the, the change in uh, or the progression in training content and intensity as we move from you know stage one, which is you know just movement and body weight with you know basic kiddie stuff which used to be phys ed but kids don't do it in phys ed now primary school phys ed um through to you know our, our stage six our elite or professional or olympic athlete type you know stuff um and, and you know really emphasizing you know having a look at you know stage three and four and five which is mainly what we deal with uh in the weight room most of our athletes stage three four and five Stage three being, you know, late high school, you know, welcome to barbell training type stuff. Um, stage four academy and stage five pro or Olympic athlete type thing. So, yeah, we're, we're looking at that for the first part and velocity in the second part, going through all the uh, all the scores that are normal and uh, how to use velocity to improve, you know, stop programming, but also coaching cues, give confidence, uh, accountability of the athlete. And, you know, we'll have a practical session where, you can see all this stuff in action and then see the ease of using velocity measures. So now some, sometimes uh, people come up to me and say, oh, but I don't, I don't want to change how I'm programming. I like to do the certain method. I say velocity doesn't change how you program. It just gives you information about your programming. So if you believe in density, if you believe in whatever you want, it's just, it doesn't change programming unless you want it to. You know, you, you, if you like to do a five by five or five, three, one, or Smolov or Shika or you know Bulgarian or weight some other Chinese weightlifting approach or, or it doesn't matter you can sort of program whatever way you want velocity just gives you scores about fatigue and strength levels if you wanted to um, you know fatigue levels at the end of a set how close you are to failure or not failure uh, what is your strength level today compared to last week or, or some other week um, so you know or, you know, you can use velocity and say, I want to avoid fatigue. So, you know, if you're working in soccer and we know the coaches there are extremely conservative and I'll go through this at the workshop, you know, how it's been used in, in, in Spain uh, in soccer players to make sure their legs aren't too fatigued so they can do all their running and training and, and so forth and the coaches don't have to worry about guys having too much DOMS because they have a certain cutoff uh, of velocity within a set so they don't get um you know, muscle soreness, they have a certain percentage cut off in velocity where they stop the set in their squats. And I'll go through all that sort of stuff as well. So it's, you know, if you're working in those sports where your coaches are very conservative, come to the workshop, all will be revealed. <laughs> and it's an evening done, is it? No, it's, in, it's uh, day one, it's 10 o'clock to three o'clock. Ah, okay, perfect, cool. So uh, I, I know a lot of guys, uh, you know, as strength and conditioning coaches, we make our money in the morning and then in the afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> So just one, very one last thing. Except have a siesta. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Uh, so just one last thing was, 
your working with Push uh, in Australia? Uh, for, yeah, for well, I don't the work Push Bundles Australia. I don't know. Well, Push is a Canadian company. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't work for them. No, uh, I'm just. Uh, uh, I sell their product. I've, been, I've, I've used Gymwear. I've used Tendo. They're fine products as well. Um, they're just more expensive. They're ten times the cost of a uh, a Push, basically, um, or nine times the cost, whatever it is. Uh, uh, so Push allows us to be more. Uh, ubiquitous and more people to access velocity trainers. I don't know the cost in the US, but it's 289 US. So whatever that is in, in pounds or euros uh, for it's people not, in Europe. It's not much different anymore, I think. No, so it, that's the price I have to sort of charge. I mean, I charge the equivalent in, in Australia um, of 289 US. Uh, so it's a good product. Uh, it's been used by a lot of pro teams in the US, San Francisco 49ers. Uh, for one, um, a heap of others are looking into it. Uh, one of the things I went around the US in that tour is, you know, I, I talked to uh, coaches at, in um, pro sports and, you know, they are going to move towards it, a lot of them. Uh, they just, you know, there are constraints on them that they're a bit worried about if I bring this thing in, you know, how does it affect training? And I say, hey, first time you use push, just use it on your best players for one or two key exercises. Don't use it on... You know, who, who gives a rat's ass about your velocity of your glute ham raise <laughs> or your reverse hyper or your upright row? You know, you measure your squat, your bench, your push press or pressing and your deadlifting or your pulls or your, and, and your jumps and throws, that sort of stuff. What's really good though, I should say in, in, in push now though, that is a feature, but there's a new software update coming in, I think next week or the week after, called free movement. It's in there now, but it'll be better enhanced in the next version. Well, you can measure anything, any movement. So if you, you want to do a medicine ball throw, if you want to do a golf swing, you want to measure your speed of your punch or your Muay Thai kick, you just strap it on and you can go measure acceleration or velocity. Acceleration will be better for those ones. But, you know, and we do it in workshops. I get guys to stand and hit like a uh, American football tackle, uh, you know, shaped like a person. So they'll go, just smash that thing. You know, put it on your forearm and just jam in with like, like a forearm jolts the face like you're hitting him. And we measure their velocities and, and stuff like that or medicine ball throws. So the push is expanded beyond just measuring, you know, squat, bench, press, deadlift, power clean type stuff. Now we, we, we go to the workshops and we have a look at contrast or complex training. Medicine ball throw, throw a 6K medicine ball, throw a 3K. You know, we'll, we'll throw a 3K, get a measure of velocity or acceleration, throw the 6K see if you potentiate and throw the 3K again. Was there improvement? Yes, well, PAP works for you, good. Next person it doesn't work for, we work that out. Yeah, it's great, you know, so we've got these free movements we can measure now on it as well. We're going beyond just the weight training sp uh, sphere of measuring velocity. We, we, we're measuring the velocity of our movements that we're doing in training, not just barbell training or gym training. And that's pretty exciting for me. No, absolutely. So I'll I'll um I'll put a link to the Eventbrite page on the on the site. So if people can't find it, it's it's always there for them. Yeah, um, I'll link the link then, mate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we'll get we'll get booked on. Um, so I know you're not on Twitter, but you're on Facebook. So there's, uh, there's yeah, a bit of, yeah. few videos and things of of uh, your training and your activity that you're getting up to on uh, on Facebook. Um, a little bit. Yeah, I don't put too much on Facebook too much. Mainly just photos of me drinking beer on Facebook. Happy <laughs> days. That's what everyone wants to see. Um, on Facebook, yes, I just put a lot of photos of the workshops from the US. Um, I want to put up a few more so people can see that, you know, some of the gyms there, they have their the colleges there. They, you know, they're great gyms. Uh, yeah, I'm on Facebook. It's uh, Dan Baker Strength Baker, I think it is. Um, I'm on Instagram or something as well. Nice. I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't go on that one too much because it's pretty hard to type on a phone when you're old. You can <laughs> see the. <laughs> I think it's an iPad to type. Because so, the big, big like, I do all this stuff. I don't know what to do. <laughs> right. But I draw the line on Twitter. I'm not doing that Twitter. I just draw the line somewhere, mate. I, I think there's. I think there's some sort of campaign going for to get you on Twitter. I. I, I don't know who's behind it, but there's definitely a campaign somewhere. Yeah, but that. that I, don't you have to be on it three times a day or something? Like, uh, be on it as much as you want, mate, I think. <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't walk around with a phone. 
I'm in Indonesia, I got my phone turned off, mate. <laughs> you know, I'm going to use my phone now to do, measure my, to, when I go to the gym and measure my push. Yeah. So, that, if I use my phone in Indonesia, Australian carrier charge me like $4 a minute or something. <laughs> I think that's a good philosophy for, for others as well. Just use it to measure your velocity and then stick it back, stick it back in the drawer. <laughs> enjoy your beer and enjoy your Australian barbecue. Oh, well, I'm in Indonesia now, mate, so I'm going to have a uh, Australian steak in Indonesia tonight after I go down to the gym after this, Robert. I'm going to do my push press and overhead work and some upper body work and things like that. Sounds I'm good to me, I, I might post a vlog for this workout. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, why not? Well, thanks a lot for your time, Dan. Really appreciate it. And I'll, uh, I'll let you get back to the uh, Bali lifestyle. Thanks, mate. No worries. Good talking to you again. I know you enjoyed it over here. I did. Absolutely loved it. Loved it in Brisbane and loved it in Bali just as much as well. Yep. Yeah, good cities. Yeah. All right, pal. Well, uh, again, thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. And I'll uh, hopefully see you in uh, on the 15th of September. All right. No worries, mate. Thank you. All right, pal. Speak soon. Bye, mate. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to episode 100 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the chat with Dan. Thank you for all your support over the last 100 episodes. And I'm not delusional enough to think that it's because of me. But thank you for tuning in and listening to all the guys that I've had on. And thank you to all the guys that have given up their time to come on for free uh, and have a chat with me um, for the podcast. So I hope you've got tons out of this episode as well as the last 99 if you haven't checked out any of the other episodes, uh, as always, they're always on iTunes and you can catch up on paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash podcast. So thanks again for your support. Really appreciate it. I hope to bring you another 100 in the future uh, and I will speak to you in episode 101.